Jean-Luc Godard blew the lid off cinema with his 1960 neo-noir Au bout de souffle. He followed up with two films about the plight of women, Une femme c'est une femme and Vivre sa vie, both excellent. He took a short detour into purely political dramas with Le Petit Soldat and Les Carabinières, and then mocked his own profession with contempt. But then in 1964, only four years after Breathless, Godard returned to cockeyed film noir in one of my absolute favorites of his, Band à part, known in English as Band of Outsiders. <laughs> The plot. A couple of would-be gangsters, Arthur and France, learn that Odile, a pretty English student, has gobs of stolen cash in her uncle's suburban home. They plan a heist, but they're clearly out of their depth. One boy's mobster family gets wind of the opportunity, and their bungled first attempt alerts the girl's uncle as well, who in his own socially acceptable white-collar way is also a thief, and he also smells a rat. Things go badly, as often happens in French crime films. As Roger Ebert liked to say, it's not what a movie is about, but how it's about it. Banda Par is a crime film, sure, but it's much more interested in its three main characters, and what makes them tick. Also, since it's Godard, it's also about the movies and the experience of watching them, and what that does to us as people. Avec l'air réjoui des écoliers qui sortent de l'école. The most opaque of the three would-be hoodlums is, is France. Tall, handsome, well-dressed, he seems like the obvious hero of the story. But France hangs back, never quite taking decisive action. He's the film's catalyst, connecting the innocent Odile to his criminally inclined friend Arthur. He lets Arthur push him around, but in their playful little moments of reenacting Hollywood gangster films, France is always the hero who gets the drop on Arthur's villain. France's lack of distinction makes him the perfect audience surrogate, like Bella in the Twilight series. We see the drama unroll before him, and we imprint his stoic reactions with our own, well, I've, I, I'd have done that, narratives. Artur, on the other hand, is a solid bastard. Callous, rude, and in the end, treacherous. He's Caliban and Iago, rolled into one short, ugly French sweater. He nearly kills Odile's aunt, and shows no regret doing so. Thankfully, at the end of the film, Godard gives us a fleeting shot of the aunt having survived the ordeal. On his first glimpse of Odile, Artur announces that he will have her when and how he feels like it. Je me despite the probability that France is already in love with her. And Artur does, through pure force of will. He's ugly, he's crass, but Artur is a force of nature. At the end, Artur strangely demands to be left behind at the estate which they've failed to rob. He has recognized the truth of Franz's story about hiding stolen goods in plain sight, a reference to Poe's The Purloined Letter, and he digs all the stolen money out of the doghouse right there in the front yard. Odile's uncle also knows Artur will come back, and he shoots him down. In a final act of brash will, Artur endures multiple gunshot wounds just to get close enough to shoot his killer down. Artur may be a horrid person, but he is an admirable force of nature. Anna Karina became ubiquitous in Godard's early films. Her performance in this one is unique. She plays Odile as an idiot, not just an innocent over her head, but a person who genuinely runs at a slower pace than the rest of the world. Artur hates her hairstyle, so she tries to fix it in the middle of an English exam. She clearly prefers France over Artur, I mean, who wouldn't? But she sleeps with Artur because he's the alpha male, and that's what you do. She stands by terrified as her loving aunt is bullied and nearly killed. Only once Artur is gunned down does she accept France and flees the homicidal mess that she's made of her life and Paris. It's not an unsympathetic performance, but it does fit with a Hollywood horror cliche of don't go up those stairs, and Odile goes up every set of stairs. The reason this sordid little tale of botched crime stands out is its postmodern flourishes. Odile, for example, carries a delicate glass gadget in her bag that, that tests the passion of anyone who touches it. Obviously, this would get destroyed in the course of her adventures, but she has it at the ready whenever needed. Several of the film's other flourishes have become famous. The Minute of Silence, which lasts about 36 seconds, is an agonizing reminder of how we can't handle life without input, even in 1964. <laughs> The nine-minute tour of the Louvre, I will admit, I have tried myself. There's a lot of stuff in that far east side of the museum that nobody ever checks out, but you have to sprint past the Mona Lisa and wing victory to get there. And the dance scene is deservedly the most famous sequence in the film. Aped by filmmakers from Tarantino to Feng Xiaogang, this quiet moment in a crappy Parisian bistro gives Godard a chance to dig directly into his character's psyches. I don't know if it's the world that's in train of becoming a dream, or the dream of the world. Plus, it looks really cool.
These characters read their world in terms that they've learned from the media. The two boys play act Hollywood, and it's no surprise that they're no match for real world criminals, white or blue collar. Odile is steeped in romanticism. The 17th century play Romeo and Juliet is hardly appropriate reading for adult second language learners, but the film lets five minutes of Shakespeare wash over Odile in what's ostensibly a translation exam. She's jumped into the deep end of the pool, and that's where she's going to stay. So when Odile and France are on a steamer headed somewhere south at the end, it's not exactly a happy end. This is a film about beginnings, not about endings. Who knows where Odile and France will end up? The movie promises, sarcastically, a follow-up about their adventures in South America, like this is some sort of pulp serial. Et c'est dans un prochain film que l'on vous racontera, en cinémascope et technicolor cette fois, les nouvelles aventures d'Odile et de France dans les pays chauds. But we know where they'll end up. Just watch Pierre Le Fou and you'll see. Van der Par is a brilliant little film, a masterpiece written on a grain of rice. On one hand, it's a cautionary tale, as was Au Bout Souffle, about taking the movies too seriously. On the other hand, it's a minuscule manifesto about how the Louvre can be a race course, about how a crappy bar can be a venue for joyful dance, about how all you need to be Bogart is a torn-up ragtop and a trench coat. Life is what you make of it.